Hey, good morning. This is Steve Stice, Chief Medical Officer here at the University of Kansas Health System, broadcasting live with you from the Dolph Simons Family Studio. We're delighted to be back with you today. Not delighted about COVID, but happy that we have a partnership with you and we can tell you the truth and be calm and reasonable and thoughtful about how we deliver that. And this morning, the numbers are still high, Dana. Mm -hmm. Now, they're not, they haven't taken back off up to 90 yet, yeah. but we're still high. Yeah, luckily they haven't. And I think a few weeks ago, we talked about this may be our new um, equilibrium in that 20 to 30 range. We may be in that new equi equilibrium right now. Hopefully it doesn't go further, but in that 70 to 80 range. So right now we have 85 active um, acute infections with 32 of those in the ICU and 13 on the ventilator. It's a pretty high equ equilibrium. Yeah, we would certainly like to get back down to um, 30. the 30s yeah. or the teens or none. Uh, we do have 41 patients who meet that recovery period but are still in the hospital because of COVID. In Hayes though, uh, they do have 30 patients, 27 active and three in that recovery period too. So it is taking up a large proportion of their hospital beds. And that's true throughout the state. As we can see, the Kansas map is on fire and, and, when, and so, is the, so is Missouri. And, and, and all of us are being uh, affected so much right now by COVID that we are mm -hmm. having to do all sorts of things, you know, open up alternative care areas, take some of our post anesthesia recovery areas and turn them into hospital beds for patients yeah. to be in to beings. We just don't have enough beds. We're opening up more ICUs. I mean, this is, we're in the, we're in the midst of that crisis and we're, we're a little encouraged, little encouraged by the, the fact that yesterday and for two days in a row, Kansas City's numbers didn't go up as much and our numbers didn't go mm -hmm. up as much. But we also know that that could just be a testing issue. There could be a lot of things that are caught, could cause a short pause. Mm -hmm. And Thanksgiving is right around the yeah. corner. The fear of Thanksgiving is a lot of people inside will spread the virus and that'll be another super spreader event mm -hmm. and that could be really devastating to the community right now so be really thoughtful around that especially because there is such good news out there and we've been short on good news yeah. we've been trying to latch out to little things hawk about trying to say uh, that that will we'll, we'll take that as good news or we'll take this but this this vaccine thing mm -hmm. on top of the monoclonal antibody that's very real mm -hmm. so really good news coming out of pfizer today yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, we have two now with Pfizer and Moderna, so I think it is very, um, it is very, um, we are optimistic because of that. Certainly, uh, we know that this is safe. All of the data points to that, but now we have the efficacy data as well for two. Um, so I, I think moving forward, and we know that with Operation Warp Speed, there was um, resources put in with the government and the companies to help start to increase those uh, those vaccine production lines so that we can get them out to as many people as quick as possible. Yeah, and I think that's really important. So the timeline for Pfizer's with that data, they're gonna, mm -hmm. I think as I understood, they're gonna submit their EUA within days. Mm -hmm. And they hope that if that gets turned around, it may be, you know, weeks before mm -hmm. the vaccine's out here, meaning you know, like, before Christmas, like yeah. that's like the best Christmas present to, to, to everyone, mm -hmm. and and it'll be lined out. Uh, uh, it'll be uh, sent out to those and uh, wave one A, which we understood to be frontline healthcare workers mm -hmm. as well as those of the most vulnerable, like patients in nursing homes. Yeah. And then it just keeps moving through beyond that. And um, I think that that we're, you know, I'm sure you and I are going to line up and get these vaccines. And I, th I think we got in, an influenza mm -hmm. shot uh, on this program. I bet yeah. we're going to have to get a. Now we're going to have to get At a. Uh, I think we're going to have to get this vaccine. Uh, somewhere like that. So that'll be good, and it, it's good to be um, uh, be able to deliver that kind of really good news because it's been a difficult long haul. Um, today we have Anil Garmarker, one of our long haul patients, speaking of long hauls, mm -hmm. and his doctor, Sharon Kraft. They're going to help answer questions about what that long haul has been like. Anil's been with us before. We're delighted to have him back in just a moment. And we're going to listen to them, but first, let's see what questions are out there from reporters. Hey, good morning, Cody Holyoke, Channel 9. Hey, Cody. How are you guys doing today? Good. Okay. Uh, with the positive vaccine news today and, and over the past week, do you think people will be more willing to listen to your warnings that you've been saying for months and, you know, from health officials, if they know potential relief is on a horizon? I'm just curious your take on that. Goody, bless you for asking that question because I've been following that line of analysis now. Every time we get to talk to an elected official and yeah. saying it every moment that we can, real hope is here. It's not that interminable hope that means you're going to have to keep making these sacrifices for so long. 
you know, if you go back to last May, when um, uh, Francis Collins, who's a head of NIH, was uh, involved with one of our board meetings, he told us he thought by the end of October, first part of November, we'd have vaccination, and that would be a game changer. Fauci has said the same thing. He said by this time next year, life's going to feel a lot more toward normal. I, I think that's where we're headed, and we just need people yeah. to still be good to help us get to the other side. So yes, I'm hopeful that this news will work to convince people of that. Um, we've been certainly using that as a lever to, to, to say to, to those who are in elected officials, public health officials here and across our region, say, look, really good news, really effective therapy that will help us change how we live is on the way. In the meantime, the most important things you can do to stay alive and help us keep patients alive is to follow the rules of infection control that we've been preaching uh, for months. And, and I think it's all about the mask. It's all about social distancing. It's all about staying in your bubble. It's all about those small groups that you, stay, you can stay with. Anytime you start intersecting groups, the likelihood mm -hmm. is that someone will have COVID-19. What's the number you have to get to to get 40 or 50 percent now, Hawk? For, for a mixing of, of a group of people, if you went out to oh, a group of 10 or a group of 20 folks. You know, last week it was if you had 15 people at your gathering, there was a 40% chance that at least one person in that gathering would have it. If it goes up to, to 25, it's just above that. And uh, 50 people, it's more than 60% chance. And again, that was last week. So. And so it's going to be even higher now. Yeah. So just think about that. If you had 15 people, if you knew somebody in that group yeah. had COVID-19, would you still get together? if you knew they did. But that's the real choice you have. You narrow it down to a small group, yeah. you wear a mask, things get a whole lot safer when that happens because masking does work. And as the weather turns cold, go prove it to yourself. Go outside, see what your breath cloud looks like, put your mask on and see what your breath cloud looks like. It's altogether different, huh? Yeah. Um Absolutely true, but we, you know, we still, and it's not the people that are watching the update and the nightly news, it's the people that aren't watching that. There is still a backlash for mask wearing and people de being demeaned for, back, uh, for wearing a mask. And it's backward thinking, it's not keeping up with the science, and it's not even complicated science. It's just not wanting to acknowledge what is really going on, what is the true reality. But we know those things can save lives. And we know from our guests, you can have just a group a meeting of four people and one can be infected. So the more people you have that do not live in your household, in mixing households, uh, the more risk you're gonna have of even just one of those people having a disease. Yeah, remember the rules. We the people, not I the one. You don't have total individual liberty. No. It's spelled out uh, in the preamble to the Constitution. Other questions? Brian Johnson with Channel 9 asks, school districts have seen an intense contrast in the speed that COVID-19 has spread over the last week. They now have in-class transmission of the virus in 50% sub-placement rates, running out of substitute teachers. Mm -hmm. What caused such a dramatic change in the last week? Is it the post-Halloween gatherings, increased temperatures related, or something else? And the answer to that, I think, Hawk, is going to be yes. Yeah. You know, anytime you're in a group of people with the masks off, mm -hmm. you're going to be in trouble. And I think that we're seeing that around schools, but especially not the classrooms, perhaps, as much yeah. as even outside the classrooms. However, I know David was talking about, and maybe you know more about this than I do, there are early signals out there that suggest opening of schools, and schools may be bigger spreading events than we thought. Um, but I think, again, it's still the gatherings, it's the socialization around the school, it's the hallways, it's, yep. it's the parties afterwards, and, and I think sports, and especially indoor sporting events, are trouble. Yeah, I think the classrooms really have been, they've done everything to make them as safe as possible with de-densifying, with the masking. But we know that um, overall, you know, young people, whether it's, you know, 40 and under or whether it's 18 and under, young people are getting together and spreading it in the community and bringing it into uh, the schools or whatever businesses they are. We know that people who have done everything right and tried to stay out of those situations get the disease because there is such widespread um, community infection right now. 
Yeah, and I think that um, in, in, in one school may not be the next school, meaning that some districts yeah. have done a really good yeah. job at de-densifying, going hybrid schedules, things like that. Others have not. And so we can't treat all schools the same. Uh, those that have not had effective, as effective masking policies or de-densifying a campus and have a, you know, more people in the classroom, maybe the six-foot rule, maybe the hallways aren't as well patrolled, whatever, those things make a difference. And so I don't think it should be a surprise to us. We saw that in colleges. Colleges did a really good job of infection prevention control, have been able to stay open, and others have had to shift to more online learning. I think KU has done a really good job. I know other schools have had to start closing their yeah. campuses early. And, all, and it shouldn't surprise any of us. It's all about the rules, right? And, and the, virus, the virus doesn't care who you think you are. It just doesn't care. And anytime you give it the opportunity to spread, that's what the viruses do. That's what makes measles so deadly. That makes what other viruses so bad. But I think that, uh, I think that, that that's the real reason. So I'm not surprised that we're seeing that rise in schools. And just to say, the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines at a 95% effective rate, that's as good as measles, Hawk. That's mm -hmm. really, really, really good. That's much better than the influenza vaccine. Yeah, much better than the influenza vaccine. Brian has another question. He says, some epidemiologists say any new restrictive measures that fall short of a total lockdown will only plateau the number of cases in our area. He wants to know if you agree. I know it's a tough question. Said, no, I'm going to be really honest. You know, as, as the numbers rise in Kansas City, I get more and more concerned that a total lockdown may be a direction we're going to have to go. Um, and, and my direction looking at that is very much in my law, lane. I'm not, I, I can't address the pain that small business owners or any business owner has and, um, and mental and emotional health. I, I, you know, that, that's, but what, and because that, that, that's real. What I can tell you is that um, we're out of beds in Kansas City. And if the numbers continue at the current ri rise, we will overwhelm our healthcare community. And then it's not just the COVID-19 patients we can't take care of. If you have a heart attack or a stroke or you need emergency surgery and there's no beds, you just, we're going to struggle. And, and so the death rate and the morbidity rate, meaning how you don't do as well from all diseases, not just COVID goes up, and that's what we're going to feel. And so I'm very concerned that um, if folks don't help us bend the curve, mm -hmm. Uh, then we're going to get forced, at least from a healthcare perspective, and saying the, we can't take care of this many patients. If we can't take care of people who are sick, that they're going to die, and 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 that means heart attacks, strokes, cancer, you know, name, name heart failure, name, you know, people who have having trouble with their asthma, their emphysema. If we can't take care of people, then that's going to really affect everyone. It's not only going to affect those who don't wear masks. And so I think that the, the, the struggle is that we're, we are all in it together. And um, we just urge everybody to, to, whether your county has a masking requirement in your area or not, just try to exercise personal responsibility to try and wear a mask and follow the rules because mm -hmm. we can bend the curve. If we can cap right now at 85 or 90 and then vaccine becomes available, okay, let's get there. Um, we're pushing things off right now that we shouldn't be, but we don't want to be pushing off. Um, but well, I don't want to say that we can manage. It needs to be lower, but higher is going to be really, really, really hard for all of the health systems in Kansas City. All of us are in this same boat. It's not just KU. It's it's all of us. And you hear that from a chief medical officer all the time. And tomorrow we'll have a little bit of that conversation. Mark Steele, the CMO over Truman, will be on, and and he can uh, add that. And we'll have our CMOs back soon. But when and when you do, you're going to hear it. It's from all of us. It's a chorus. It's not a solo. All right. Last call yeah. for reporter questions before we move on. All right. I'm not hearing anything. Mm -hmm. You may recall the story of Neil Garmacher. He was one of our patients who contracted COVID-19 back in April. And Neil was on a ventilator for a time. He's been in and, out of the ho in and out of the hospital. And because he's had some airway complications, that his physician, who is also with us today, and we're back, glad that she's back on, because Shannon, your, 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 your thing dropped off, so now Shannon Kraft is an ear, nose, and throat physician here at K is back on. Delighted to have you with us, Shannon. Thanks for being here. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about what it's like to be a long hauler and what are some of the things that they've had to go, um, uh, to go through. So, Neil, tell us a little bit about where you are in your life. I know you just had another procedure. You're back in town again. How are you feeling? How are things going for you? 
Uh, well, my vocal cords are a little angry at me from yesterday, but mm -hmm. um, I think we're we're kind of. I, I think uh, Dr. Kraft said we're improving a little bit. Um, we're kind of just uh, in a wait and see. Um, you still have shortness of breath. Still have a, a little trouble breathing at times. I know some fatigue, but other than that, you know, I'm glad to not be in the hospital again for the last three months. Uh, I consider that's that a success. Victory. Yeah, that's a victory. I mean, you've been, you've really had a, a tough road on the recovery um, from this. And, and congratulations to you for having you've done as I know you've worked so darn hard at this as an ICU physician. I spent years doing this kind of stuff and, and um, uh, have watched people do that and see them back in clinic. You, you, you've had that hard road and, and, and talk to us a little bit about what is it like mentally and emotionally, the toll being a long hauler has taken on you and your family? Um, I, I, honestly, it's been, I think it's been harder on my wife than it's been on me. Um, before the, the trach, we were in and out of the hospital almost every other day. Uh, my wife would, wouldn't sleep at night. She would, um, she would stay up while I was sleeping because she was afraid I wouldn't wake her up if I stopped breathing. So she would wait till I was up to sleep. I mean, it was definitely, it, it took a toll. It was, you know, it was day by day. I know the last time on the way to the ICU, um, my wife was watching uh, mile markers and where we were at from Wichita to Kansas City because she didn't think I'd make it all the way this time. You know, she was she was waiting to see where she'd have to call for help. And I, I know that trauma from day one, from April until now, you know, I, I really feel it was worse on her. I mean, it was dramatic on me, don't get me wrong, but I feel much worse about how it affected her and the people closest to me. You know, what do you say to people out there who still want to be deniers of how bad COVID-19 is or call it influenza or don't want to wear a mask? You know, I figured this question was coming, so I thought about it for a bit. And, um, you know, I'll be much more transparent than I've been in the past. Um, before I contacted it, uh, and it's ridiculous and inexcusable when I had a friend that was a critical care nurse in New York City when I got sick, and I, I heard what was going on there. And I, I firmly believed that as healthy as I was, you know, I, I wouldn't get it. It wouldn't affect me. I even told my wife it wouldn't be that serious if I got it. Um, I didn't think it would be in our region. It was a big city problem. It was a problem for people seriously ill or elderly. And, you know, even, even when my mom dropped me off at the ER, you know, as a nurse, she didn't use PPE to drop me off for the 20 minute drive. And because of that day at home and that drive, you know, my last thought before the ventilator was, oh my God, I've killed my family. And, you know, I mean, COVID didn't care what I believed, you know, it, it was there and it was waiting, you know, and it, you know, I gave lip service to being careful and I could have been more careful and I wish I would have been, but, you know, and thank God, you know, COVID didn't care what I believed and thank God everyone at KU when I got there, they didn't care either and they fought like hell and it took an inordinate amount of labor and man hours and doctors and nurses to keep me alive and get me back, you know, even up till now. And I, I just, you know, it scares me if enough people show up that need as much care as I needed to stay alive, if there will be enough services to keep them there or for people to recover. You know, I'll never be able to say it better than you just did. Thank you. Shannon, first of all, what a special patient you've got here. <laughs> yes, sir. Absolutely. He's been a fantastic patient. Talk to us a little bit about some of the battles that Anil's had to face and some of that you've seen in other COVID-19 patients. 
Absolutely. Um, so I should start by saying that what uh, Mr. Gallmacher is experiencing is not unique to COVID, but because COVID causes significant respiratory um, distress, uh, um, patients require ventilation. And so the injury that has happened here is um, because of the need for ventilation. Um, we know from the data out of China that approximately 10 to 15 percent of people will have um, sufficient disease to require intubation. Um, and the same disease processes, the same medical comorbidities that make you prone to having a more severe course with COVID um, are more likely, um, are also associated with um, a higher incidence of um, intubation-related trauma. And so um, uh, I'm very grateful that Anil has uh, allowed me to kind of talk a little bit about what's going on with his throat. Um, and so what, for those of you out there uh, in the community that uh, don't have experience with intubation, I brought a little prop today. Um, this is an endotracheal tube. This is what goes into someone's throat uh, when we need to help them breathe. Now we intubate hundreds of patients a day here for surgeries and, and it's not a big deal. But when you have a critically ill patient um, with other medical comorbidities, this tube that sits between your vocal cords can actually put pressure on those cords and cause um, inflammation. Um, as it turns out, the cartilage that supports our throat, our larynx and our voice box is very sensitive um, to that pressure and it can compromise the blood flow. For this reason, patients who have diabetes, um, obese patients, patients with cardiovascular disease, um, for whom it is more difficult to ventilate or who have um, impaired perfusion or blood flow to these areas, the addition of this little balloon in the throat when it blows up to create the seal um, can shut down that blood flow for a period of time. And what this results in then is that cartilage becoming sick and inflamed and, and starting to collapse. Um, Mr. Gallmacher is my first patient uh, with COVID, but he is uh, unfortunately not my only patient who um, uh, has had um, laryngotracheal injury secondary to intubation due to their time in the ICU. And these are complicated problems um, to fix. Um, these often require multiple surgeries. Um, many patients who have to uh, actually have to have a tracheotomy to support their airway. Um, and I think one of the, I mean, one of the most disappointing things, and particularly from a patient's perspective is, is when you leave the ICU um, after a long bout with a respiratory illness and you think that uh, things are going well, this creeps up. It creeps up on you two, um, two to three months after the intubation many times, and then you find yourself dealing with a whole host of other problems. So as we see more and more people being intubated, we anticipate that we're going to be seeing more and more people with these types of injuries requiring surgery and even tracheostomy to manage. Yeah, this is a tough time. And because there are so many people with injuries like this, you're going to be really busy. This is kind of your area of air, nose, and throat. So yes, sir. Uh, I, I suspect you'd like to be a little less busy on this one. Uh, yes, sir. You never want to put a trach in someone um, unless you have to. Um, it's a great tool. Um, it's a very useful tool. Um, um, but, you know, our goal for Mr. Gallmacher is to continue to work on expanding his airway and trying to get that bigger. And, and the hope is to be able to get that out someday. All right. And Shannon, don't make me feel a little quit saying, sir. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a habit. I'm sorry. I have the same one. All right. Let's see what questions we have, Jill. All right. Stephanie wants to know, when the doctor says we are out of beds in KC, do you mean KU or in the entire metro area? So we're, you know, we, we're running a beds. I can't um, talk to every, uh, about every single hospital. I just know that we have now developed a report that shows the number of staffed beds available in Kansas City, and those are showing few beds. And so we are running out of beds in the entire metropolitan area, all things, if you put them all together. And, um, and, and, and so what's going on at KU is a reflection of what's going on across. We're all trying to find more staff to help work beds um, uh, and to get more physical beds. But I think, you know, we are running out of beds. And again, that, that's the same message we gave last week to the public health officers and to the elected officials. It's what we said on Friday afternoon when we had a press conference with uh, reporters and others because we're trying to get a message across that folks have to take this seriously. And Neil gave you the best personal testimony of anyone that you'll ever hear about about how serious it is. We're telling you, we don't have a lot of beds. You gotta follow the rules. If you don't follow the rules, things are gonna get worse. And if they're gonna get worse, they're not only gonna affect the people with COVID-19. Every disease is affected when we don't have enough beds. Um, Cindy wants to know, will Anil ever get off his ventilator? Well, I think what she's trying to say probably is, is, is are you ever gonna get off that trach, Anil? And let's talk to you and Shannon and, and, and see where that's gonna go for you. 
Um, I, I, I know Shannon's or Dr. Kraft is hopeful, um, but to be honest, I think there's a lot of unknowns. And uh, she was very clear to me that, you know, it's a possibility we may not. And so just so the public knows, <laughs> that little whistle you hear each time Neil takes a breath is the air going through his trach. And so that's what we're listening to, because really as he takes a breath, the air is going in and out of his trach and less so in and out of your mouth, I think, right now. Is that right, Anil? Oh, yeah, that, that's correct. Especially yeah. after the surgery, everything's a little mad at me this morning. All right. Shannon, what do you think? How will Anil do and how do people like him fare in the long run? You know, so it really depends upon where the injury is. And so I do have to say, sorry, Neil, I was the one that beat him up just a little bit yesterday, but we are working on trying to get that airway bigger. Um, there are multiple levels where one of these tubes can cause an injury. One is at the level of the vocal cords, one is at the level right below the vocal cords, and one is the trachea itself. Um, when things get really complicated is when the injury involves multiple levels. Um, when the injury is involving just a trachea itself, um, this can often be addressed by a surgery known as a tracheal resection, where we take out the abnormal portion of the trachea and sew things back together. And when I do this, I work with Dr. Um, Nirmal Viramakshanini, uh, who helps me with those particular surgeries. Um, when the injury is higher, when it's uh, right below the vocal cords involving the vocal cords, it becomes more complicated because that is not a static um, structure, it's dynamic. The vocal cords hinge open and closed. Um, and that is actually the narrowest part of the adult airway. And so for Anil, um, we have been, uh, after we put his trach in to secure his airway to give him a safe way to breathe, uh, we have been working on uh, local steroid injections and dilations to try to open that up um, right now, the trach that you see in his neck goes, it's underneath the area of swelling. And so we basically bypassed the narrow area to provide him a safe way to breathe. Our hope is, is we can get that area above the trach big enough that we'll be able to pull the trach out someday. If we are not successful in doing this with endoscopic procedures, then we may have to pursue a bigger surgery in the future. Um, but um, those carry their own risks and complications. Um, and the same uh, medical conditions that put you at higher risk for having uh, the stenosis also make you a higher risk for poor outcomes with those surgeries. So we do try conservative things first. Um, there's some progress um, for Neil. He's able to do some capping. And so I'm optimistic. We're going to try some things here um, in the near future to see, um, to kind of test things out a little bit and see how close we are. All right, well, good luck and good luck to you both. Uh, Celia with the Kansas News Service has joined the call. She said she was late and she has a couple of questions. Celia, are you there? Um, yes, I am. Can you hear me? We can, Celia. How are you? I, I'm fine. And Anil, it's great to see you again. And I, I hope you're well and that your family's well. Um, I was wondering, so for people who go through, you know, what Anil is going through now and might, you know, get COVID now and need ventilation now, what do we know about whether in Kansas there are enough of the supplies for ventilators and the ventilators themselves and the, I don't know if respiratory, you know, physician or what is the right term, but the specialized physicians that we need for them? You bet. So, um, and, and Hawk, you can comment on yeah. this as well. I think right now, the, because uh, we do have more ventilators, we've all been able yeah. to purchase more ventilators, I don't think we have a shortage of ventilators. Right. The other thing is that because of things like remdesivir and steroids and Lovenox, we, there are more people, the, the ratio, I think, help me with this, Hawk, yeah. the ratio between the people in hospital beds and the people in ventilators is yeah. a little better than it was yeah. early in it, when as a yeah. whole bunch of folks were, if you're in the hospital, a lot of them went to the ICU. We don't have as many going to the ICU. So we're, I think we're a little better off mm -hmm. than that. Now, as far as ICU docs like me, yeah. um, I, we're always in short supply. Right. Yeah, we're always, that's also the problem. But the, the real problem is um, it's really, it's, it's ICU nurses, it's respiratory therapists, and that's just because there aren't enough beds and, and floor nurses. That, that, those are the, yeah. That's where the real shortage is. Yeah. And so we call those staff beds. Do you have the resources to run a lot of beds? And so do you have a lot of telemetry? And there was a couple of hospitals I've talked to that said, man, we just don't have another bed with telemetry, which means monitoring abilities. And so the, the hospitals were not built with the idea that we're gonna get overwhelmed by a pandemic like this. And, and I think there was also been more hope that people would be a little more responsible around stuff. So yeah, uh, I think to your point, you know, we have a third of our patients right now um, that are in the ICU that are on the ventilator. So there's a 60% that are not. I think we are actually kind of having some trouble 
um, or in the near future will with those high flow nasal cannulas. So not necessarily the ventilator, but another mechanism of delivering a large amount of oxygen to somebody without putting them on the ventilator. But just as you said, and I, I talked about this yesterday a little bit, you know, a lot of people um, that enjoy football, a lot of people aren't as lucky as we are to have Patrick Mahomes. They're say, you know, to win, we need a quarterback. Well, if you ask the coaches, you can't just go out and pick up a quarterback. It's the same thing for this, whether it's the respiratory therapists that are specialized and trained, whether it's the ICU nurses, whether it's the floor nurses, whether it's the physicians, um, or whether it's the teachers. We're seeing a lot of teachers are out now, whether it's um, full-time or substitute, because it's just hard to go out and, and fill in those gaps that are now occurring because of quarantine or actual infection. So it's really the staffing seems to be more of a problem than the actual mechanical ventilators themselves. Yeah, I think we're going to run short. Though I think we're going to run short on staffing and physical beds before, before the ventilator question, yeah. and uh, the, the but the staffing is what's going to drive the shortage as much as anything. Shannon, are you feeling any different down in the ENT area from what you're seeing around that? Um, I'm sorry. As far in as terms the shortages, staffing, yeah, yeah. Well, st staffing, but also just the, the shortage of equipment and things. Mm -hmm. We seen any? Yes. So one of the, um, you know, early on, uh, particularly in China, a number of ENT physicians uh, in, in England as well got ill because we we work um, where the virus lives. We, we work in the nose, the nasopharynx, and the upper airway. Um, so we've uh, for, been very fortunate to have great leadership with Dr. Chu, who uh, was very early to kind of step up our game in terms of acquiring sufficient PPE, but also employing protocols. Um, the biggest change I think that we have currently is that because we, we do have these safety protocols, protocols in place. Um, it, uh, and specifically, we have to let rooms set for so long after we perform scopes, which is part of our almost everyday practice. Um, um, that does decrease the volume of patients that we can see in person uh, because those rooms have to be processed differently and that equipment does have to be processed adequately um, before you know we can, we can see additional patients. So it does create a bit of a backlog and that's been the biggest issue for us. Other so questions? Any more questions? Yeah, I was wondering then, so for Anil, if he um, continues to need a trach long term, and I know it's already been months, but if it's if it's going to be years, what are the, the health issues involved with that and how often um, might he need to go to KU Health for um, follow-up procedures or checks? Shannon, thoughts? Um, yes, so I do have many patients with trachs for many different reasons. Um, if we are not successful in getting the tracheostomy um, out of anneal, um, uh, it is possible to live uh, a long, full life with a tracheostomy. Um, I think I lost the sound there. Um, but uh, those patients do have some limitations. Um, you, you can, you'll never swim again. That's a direct conduit into your airway. Um, you have to make changes in the way that you take a shower. Um, it really does have, more than anything, a huge impact on your quality of life. So while it is the thing that allows you to breathe and to live life, it changes the way. In terms of follow-up, if this ends up being a long-term trach for Mr. Uh, Farmacher, um, Typically, I will see patients every three to four months for routine trach care um, um, and to make sure that um, the trach is healthy. Mm -hmm. All right. And then, you know, have you, you must have thought about that in your life. What do you think? It's definitely been an adjustment. Um, I know the first time I took a shower, I tried to drown myself, but I've gotten better with time on how we handle that. I definitely needed some help for my wife keeping it clean. Um, it's, it's uh, as much as it's an adjustment in that way, I still uh, appreciate it more than anything, being able to get air again. Um, didn't realize how bad it was until I could get air. I mean, I would obviously love to be back close to where I was before, but if this is as far as we get it a little farther, I, I, I'm still happy there. Good luck with that. Yeah. Any other questions, ma'am? Um, so, so Anil, have you been able to, I'm gathering that um, this continues then to disrupt your life in terms of ability to work as well and, and, and you know, other, other parts of your life? 
yeah, I definitely had to scale back how much I was working, if, if much at all. Um, I, I just, there's been times I've needed to take breaks or, you know, I, I have to be careful what environments I'm in because not only water, but dust, oil, grease, any, anything is kind of a direct conduit, as Dr. Kraft put, straight to my lungs. Um, right now, while I'm still recovering, for the most part, we've also, um, I think I call it a firewall, we've increased our firewall in the house because uh, while I'm recovering and with everything we're doing, it's definitely uh, scares us not so much to get COVID, but we're being extremely careful not to have any extra contact with any anyone that might have a flu or cold or anything that might um, slow things down more than where we're in the trajectory we're going. <clears throat> All right. All right. Other questions, Jill? Yeah. Um, Melissa wants to know, can you speak to the level of seriousness at Hayes Med, knowing that their bed capacity is... Yeah, you know, we're in pretty regular contact and maybe we can arrange for um, uh, a discussion soon with Heather who can join us, the chief medical officer there at Hayes. But I think they, like all of us, are struggling with trying to figure out how do I take care of our routine patients as well as how do I take care of all these people with COVID and seeing the numbers go up and being concerned about what's going on around them. You have to remember Hayes is only at, isn't going to only be taking people from Ellis County. It's all the counties around there. It's one of the, it, it's really one of the last bastions of of more of a, a, a referral hospital mm -hmm. as you go west. And so uh, for central western Kansas, hey, people, places like Hayes and Salina and Garden City, those are really important. And I think that Dodge City, and I think is what, ha what we see happening is that those counties all have really high and rising rates of COVID-19. And so that is going to affect their ability to deliver care. And, and then they're trying to look to transfer the sickest of the sick to other places. And it's all just filling up. So the stories in Kansas City are being replayed. And we had a meeting this morning with physicians throughout this and providers throughout the state. And, and, and I think the message is still the same. You know, we're having a harder time bringing people into Kansas City. Everybody's having a harder time uh, um, transferring patients. And it's all because the beds are full. And, and so we're really at that place we are most afraid of right from the start. Tammy says that she tested positive for COVID. Symptoms were normal, everyday cold, bad headaches, slight chest burning. She said that she was told once you get it, you're immune, and she would not have to quarantine a second time. She goes, she doesn't understand why we would have to quarantine. That's not good, Hawk. That's yeah. probably not the right information. No, absolutely not. We know that infection, reinfection can occur. Um, we don't know what happens when you get reinfection. Some people have had no symptoms. Some people have had worse symptoms. We also don't understand exactly can you transmit the virus to other people the, the theory, uh, the thought is yes, you can still transmit to the virus to other people, even with reinfection. Uh, we just don't know the full answer to that question. So, you know, after you get the virus, after you had the first round of disease, you continue to have to use those pillars that we've talked about, masking, not meeting in large groups, distancing, all those things in an effort to protect yourself from getting it again and the possibility of spreading it to others again. Ryan wants to know, are the monoclonal antibody infusions being used in the emergency department setting for patients who are not sick enough to be admitted or only in outpatient settings? Uh, that's a great mm -hmm. question. We'll come yeah. to that. And so what yeah. do you think, Hawk? Um, I think it depends on what health system and where you're at. Um, a lot of the emergency departments, unfortunately, around the nation are filled up with patients. They don't have the space to be able to do that. Uh, we are working on a separate site to be able to do that, an infusion site, so that you can go and do it as, as an outpatient infusion there, not the emergency department, because we know how full our hospital and our emergency department is. But you might, if you're not going to be admitted, you might be able to redirect it to the yes, infusion site. Absolutely. Because the key is you have to get it within seven or ten days uh, on yeah. the monoclonal antibody infusion. Yep. The other thing is, right now there's so many people that need it, and there's a limited supply of the monoclonal antibodies. As that supply gets better, we'll also have all have uh, place it will also all be in better shape so have we infused anybody yet or is that coming this week um, it is coming this week yes we haven't yet uh, we are still waiting on some final protocols and IT kind of things 
but really uh, the physical space is set up. We're just waiting on some of the I's to be dotted and T's to be crossed. So, you know, I think we were all surprised by the speed in yeah, which this actually came rapid. to us. It was a lot more rapid, which just tells you folks are ready. I think this is going to be the story of the vaccine. I think it's going to just appear on our doorstep one yeah. day. Hey, by the way, here's the vaccine. By the way, it's minus 70. Are you right? right. Because, because I think that, that I think it's going to it's going to feel a little like this because this is sort of how remdesivir, remdesivir just sort of appeared one day. Yeah, I think the, this has appeared one day. And I think it's just everybody's working so hard to try and get it out there. Last question. Yeah, and we do have a lot of vaccine questions, which I'm saving to tomorrow because we yeah. have vaccine experts on, which you're going to talk about in a second. But tons of people are asking about indoor sports this mm -hmm. fall and about singing in church because apparently, according to the thread, some of that is happening. And they just wonder, yeah. what do you think about those two activities? You know, I, I, I come back to this, and, it, and, it, and it, 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 it sounds a little repetitious. Those of you who've been with us for a while will know, about, will know what we're going to say. Uh, it's all about the rules of infection control. Can you sing in church? You know, probably not. Not really. Not not safely. Now, if you're if you got twenty or thirty feet between you and the next person, and you're wearing a mask, yeah, okay, you probably can. But is that really how it's being carried out? I think indoor sports are going to be a problem. Um, first of all, the room turnover rate in most gyms is really not very fast. And I think that just means we're going to run into trouble with that area. And, and, and so that's a concern. The second concern, meaning and when I say room turnover rate, the air is in that gym, the virus will sit there, and I just, I just am not convinced how fast some of those buildings are able to, get, to, 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 to bring in fresh air. The second thing is people tend to scream and shout. And the third thing is they may not be wearing a mask. And fourth thing is, People don't always follow those rules of social distancing inside a gymnasium. I think that the, 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 the fans are more at risk maybe than even the kids. I do think the kids are at risk too. But when you put a lot of fans together like that, plus they're an older generation, then I think that's a problem, Hawk. Yeah, absolutely. I know some of the sports uh, entities and leagues are having only one or two parents there. But just as you said, you know, when it's outdoors, football, soccer, whatever that may be, baseball, and there's cheering that's outdoors. You can probably separate a lot better. Uh, but we know parents are going to cheer. And when that happens in an indoor space, just as you said, with the air, air turnover and maybe lack of turbulent airflow, it's just going to be at higher risk of spreading the disease. All right. So before we turn to our final comments today, I just want to remind our listeners that tomorrow we're going to update the AstraZeneca Phase 3 trial. That'll be great news. We'll be live with a mobile van that is also going to go to some of the harder hit areas of the community and talk about how we're enrolling folks for the vaccine trials in those communities. Dr. Mario Castro, who is the med center here, uh, is a division director for pulmonary and, and uh, head of our, our uh, clinical trials unit. He's going to be back along with Dr. Um, Barbara Pahood, who is from Children's Mercy, and Mark Steele, the executive chief clinical officer at Truman. All are going to be focused on the, the AstraZeneca vaccine trials, but really just vaccination in general. So tomorrow we'll be having a long conversation about vaccines. I think that's going to be great. We look really forward to that. Um, Dr. Kraft, final thoughts this morning. You know, as you go out um, into the world, just be safe, wear your mask, um, wash your hands, and, and be nice to one another. Um, it's trying times for everyone, and, and we appreciate that, and we appreciate that folks are fatiguing, and I know that everyone here at the, the hospital is doing their best to make sure that we can take care of all the folks in the Kansas City community and, and their medical needs. You bet. Hawkeye, final thoughts? Um, I think everybody, you know, go back and retweet or re-listen or send out Anil's comments. Those are the most striking thing. These aren't just numbers of people being infected and dying. These are individual people, people that are our friends, people that we love. Um, Anil exemplifies that more than anybody. And just retweet that, listen to it, get it out there because um, it can happen to anyone. You know, Neil, I love to give hugs, and I wish I could give you and your wife a hug right now. And, and uh, that that I'm a hugging doctor. I hug my patients, and, and uh, I think they're really important. I'd like to hug all the researchers out there who are helping get this vaccine, the monoclonal antibodies, give the folks at Pfizer and Moderna and all the ones that have worked on a big hug because it will make a difference for us. And, and uh, so, Neil, why don't you sign us off today? Tell us your final thoughts. You know, the toward the hospital, you know, it, it's, I know that my girls were very excited to finally get to meet Dr. Kraft, to, even if just see her on screen since with all the protocols, they haven't been able to see her. And for her and her team, I just want to let you know how much we appreciate everything. You know, how, how much you guys reached out to us. And 
how compassionate you guys have been. Even if it was just someone touching a foot, you know, and, and a really hard time, you know, everything was noticed and we do appreciate it. And, Thanks. you know, I don't think he's part of your team, but he might be Will in the RT. I think he's been the most amazing respiratory therapist we've ever, you know, experienced in ICU. And, you know, yeah. my girls, my family, we just want to thank you and everyone. Absolutely. It's been our pleasure. And, and please tell your girls I said hi. And um, even if this is only how we get to meet, you've got a great dad, guys. Take good care of him. Thank you. Thank you. Is this really any different from a bad flu season? And my answer was easy. That's one of the easier questions that I've been asked lately. We never have two ICUs or three ICUs full of intubated influenza patients. Even in the worst of the years, H1N1, for example, wasn't like this. This is not the flu. We made our mark in this program by not flap jacking. We don't flap our arms and jack with the truth. We try and be calm and tell you the truth. And, and today we did. You know, this is the truth. I would actually then say to everyone watching, I would actually implore you now to take another step and say it is now time for each of us individually to be more aggressive, more aggressive in how we um, follow the rules of infection prevention and control, more aggressive in how we pare down our bubble size. We have to take care of each other. This is a character issue. We're going to take care of each other or we're going to say that our individual decision to not wear a mask and to go out to party and do different things trumps we the people.